today is August 20th, 2010. We are interviewing James Quint in Mobile, Alabama. Mr. Quint is 84 years old and he was born on December the 3rd, 1925. My name is Juan Rivera. I will be conducting the interview. This interview is being conducted for REI Productions and the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. Mr. Quint and I met through an article that was written about Duty Bound, a TV series dedicated to the men and women of World War II. Mr. Quint, would you state for us your name and your age, sir? James E. Quint, age 84 years old. Okay. And what branch of service were you in, sir? Marine Corps. And when did you enlist? Uh, November 24, 1943. Very good. Before we get into um, your actions and so forth, let's just step back a little bit prior to you going in. Uh, you were born in Mobile, I'm, in, I'm sorry, Biloxi, Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay. Um, tell me, where were you at and do you recall uh, hearing of Pearl Harbor? Very vividly. Mother and dad was, uh, they had gone somewhere, I had walked from my house to the Singer Theater in Biloxi to see a movie, came back and it was cold. Mom and dad were still gone, so I fixed a cup of hot chocolate and turned the radio on. And that's when I heard uh, about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And what, what did you think when you heard what you were hearing? Actually, I didn't even, uh, I don't think I knew where Pearl Harbor was. And at the time, uh, I had no idea we'd be going to war. So you said your parents were out. They came back. Did you tell them what was going on? Oh. Or had they heard about it while? They, they hadn't. I left the radio on. And of course, it was a continuous broadcast uh, about Pearl Harbor, about the Japanese attacking. And do you recall your parents' reaction to what they were hearing? No, uh, I think we were all just sort of stunned and, well, gee, that doesn't affect us. That's way across, halfway across the world. That's in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what kind of occupation did your parents have? Dad ran the telephone company in Biloxi. He started when there was only three men that uh, worked for Southern Bell. And uh, he retired in 50... About 53, 54 uh, from Southern Bell. Had almost 50 years service. And your mother was a homemaker? Oh, right. Okay. And how many siblings do you have? I had, uh, there were four of us in the family, three boys and one girl. And m my sister and I are the only two living. Okay. And of the three boys, did any of them join the military uh, during the war? My oldest brother was uh, married and he was deferred. Then my next brother, who was eight years older than me, uh, joined the CBs, 31st CB Construction Battalion. And he joined that out of Gulfport? Uh, out of or Biloxi? Biloxi, I think, yeah. All right. I had to go to New Orleans to enlist. Okay. So you enlisted in November of 43. Right. And you, um, you, you were drafted or you enlisted on your own? No, 17. I volunteered. Okay, volunteered. And your parents had to sign for you. Right, exactly. And did they have a problem with that or they said, that's fine, we'll do it? No, uh, by this time, all my friends, were, most of them had gone into service and we were all wanting to get in, as you say, kill Japs. <laughs> and was there any particular reason for joining the Marine Corps versus the Army? Uh, well, I had uh, I was very interested in aviation at one time, and I saw a recruiting poster, not at one time, but during high school. We had a model airplane club, and I saw a recruiting poster showing uh, Douglas Dauntless dive bomber. And it was a Marine Corps recruiting poster. And at the same time, they, uh, I had a good friend that went in 
the Marine Corps, and he wrote me a letter back. He had just been firing his M1 on the rifle range. I thought, that's exactly what I want. I want to join the Marine Corps, get to flying the Douglas Dauntless. That way I'll be able to shoot and fly to and drop bombs. That's what I'm going to do. Of course, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so you enlisted um, there in Biloxi as in well? In Biloxi, okay. yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And where was your uh, boot camp at? Boot San Diego. Tell me about that. It was seven weeks uh, total boot camp. Three weeks in San Diego. Uh, three weeks at Camp Matthews north of San Diego, which was a rifle range. Uh, three weeks there. And the seventh week back in San Diego uh, to finish up and graduate. Okay, so after your training, then where were you assigned? We went from there to um, join the 5th Marine Division that was just being formed at Camp Pendleton and was assigned to an artillery unit, 13th Marine Regiment, 5th Division. So you became an artillery man then? You were right. Okay. Uh, what specifically did you do within that and how many people did it typically take to fire uh, a cannon of that? As I recall, there were about 12 in each crew. And I was a gunner that uh, actually sighted in and gave the command to, to fire when the command came over the headphones to fire. And uh, the particular field piece, 75 millimeter howitzer, was designed to be, we had a saying that the Army uh, had mules to pull it, and the Marine Corps had Marines. And we, we had four ropes we could hook to it. Once it got put into position to move, and we could move it across anywhere, just about. And at one point on Iwo Jima, we had to actually do that, take it, take it apart and carry it up in the front lines to fire direct fire. Okay, so you um, were assigned to the 5th Marine Division and you were in Camp Pendleton and then you went to Hawaii. From Hawaii, where did you go? What did you do then? Well, from Hawaii, we went to Iwo Jima. After Iwo Jima, we came back to Hawaii, same, same camp, Camp Tarawa, uh, and came back there on a Friday. We debarked. Uh, that was the day President Roosevelt died, as I recall, and that was on a Friday. Monday morning, we jumped from the 75 millimeter pack howitzer to the 155 howitzer and started training because the timeline was getting close to the invasion of Japan, which was going to be the next campaign. Okay. So how did you adapt to military life from going from a civilian to now a regimented life of you got to be here at this time, you got to get up this, you got to do that. Tell me how that, how you uh, adapted to that. Well, it was best that you did adapt to it or you got in bad trouble with your superiors. <laughs> but of course it was regimented, uh, you know, you had to get up at a certain time, you had to stand in line for your meals, you had to do this, do that. And um, it, uh, I didn't find it bad at all. I mean, you had a regular bedtime, a regular get, getting up time, regular meal times. So it was easy to adapt to. Okay. Now, you say you were sent to Iwo Jima. Needless to say, that's one of the Marine Corps' great history moments, as well as our country militarily mm -hmm. as well. Um, can you tell me, uh, when you got there, what was it like? And let's, let's take our steps through there and, and, and go through that history. Okay, first, we were told our intelligence, Marine, uh, uh, American intelligence, was pitiful. They told us there would be only 12,000 Japs on the island and that uh, we probably wouldn't even go ashore with three divisions sitting out there. We'd be held in reserve. And then uh, it should be over with in three or four days. And they were bad wrong. <laughs> there was not 12,000, but 22,000 on the island. And it took five, almost six weeks to take care of it. So when you got there, you guys disembarked from ships. You set up camp. There was already camp set up there. How did that work? We went there on LSTs. And then from the LSTs, the pieces were transferred to ducks, the amphibious vehicles. 
and went out to buy a ramp at sea and actually went out and went into the beach on the there. Then several days later, the LSTs came, uh, two or three days later. The beach was still plenty hot. Uh, the whole island was. And uh, then they came in and we could go down and unload ammunition, supplies, and so forth. Okay, so as you were explaining to me, you're, that was basically just a, a bunch of lava fields. Uh, it was, um, you couldn't walk in it, you couldn't run in it. When you stepped, you'd go down almost to your knees in some places. And you couldn't dig a foxhole in it because it would cave in on you. And um, it was just, uh, there was just nothing there. There was no water on the island. And uh, we had uh, one canteen of water, which was a quart of water a day. That was to brush your teeth, to drink, and <laughs> anything else for several weeks. Now, when you got there, how many, you said there was a reported number of Japanese that were thought to have been there. Um, was there a lot of engagements between the enemy and you? Well, of course, in artillery, uh, until we fired direct fire, you didn't see them. I mean, we would get fire missions, and uh, you never could stop them, even though we got constant shelling, counter battery fire. Uh, we couldn't seek shelter in the foxhole. We had to keep shooting. And uh, uh, when we went up, our particular gun went up and fired direct fire, then we could see what we were shooting at. Now, did you guys receive artillery fire back at you as well? We received all kinds. What the Japanese <coughs> would do, uh, they had anti-aircraft guns, of course, and they could roll them out on tracks, the big ones from the caves, just fire anywhere up in the air. The island was so small and so crowded that any of them falling down would hit somebody somewhere. And at one point, um, well, it got to be very common. You would see they'd get out and fire a drum and then close the door and get in there real quick by the time counter battery fire. I fired zeroed in on them. So um, we'd have to wait till they rolled the gun out, then standing there loaded with our cannons, they would give the command to fire. But um, uh, it was <laughs> it was one heck of a mess. <laughs> How often did that happen? Uh, the, How often did that happen? The Japanese firing the anti I, Oh, almost constantly, yeah. Uh, in fact, at one point, you could look out, we had just a shallow depression where a field piece was set up, like howitzer, and you would see them boom, 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 hitting the ground. And at one point, they walked right across the, a gun pit. And I was lying down, my good buddy from Idaho, uh, the shots came right across, the shells came right across the pit. One of them exploded right to my back. I didn't get any shrapnel from it. But I reached over and pulled a jagged frag fragment out of his uh, calf of his leg. That was about four and a half inches long and about an inch and a half wide that came in there. And because uh, anywhere those shells fell, they, they could almost inflict ca casualties from it. So this became a daily part of life, so to speak. Uh, did you guys really think or wonder, um, you know, is this going to be my last day? Uh, could I be killed? I mean, what was your guys' thoughts? What was the thinking among the that's, group? That's or because you were young, you were invincible? You know, right. That's exactly what I was going to say because when you're 17, just turned 18, it's not going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you. And uh, this is one big game you know, until you start seeing half a body sitting around arms flying through the air, pieces and dead Japs all around you, and uh, then you realize this is getting serious, and one of these may get me, but it's not going to get me, it's going to get you. Right. In invincible, that's the word I was looking for. I guess that's part of survival instinct to I some degree, so. I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how long were you on Iwo Jima in total? It was about, as I recall, four to five, maybe almost six weeks. Yeah. Um, 
And how many fire missions would you say that you guys did? Ooh, hundreds, maybe thousands, yeah. And how many pieces of artillery would you, or I should say rounds, would you send down range during a, uh, any given time? Well, our battery consisted of four pieces. And when you would be getting on the target, they'd always do it with gun number two. And then when they zeroed in the target with the one gun, in the meantime, the other three howitzers are following with the same elevation, same uh, deflections and so forth. And then when it comes time to really start firing, then they'd give the command, uh, instead of number two one round, uh, fire at will, for example, and just firing. Also, we had what we called roving, uh, rolling barrages, where you fired one round every uh, 10 seconds. And that, you kept moving as the troops advanced and you shooting in front of them like that. Um, so you guys also gave uh, support fire. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Support fires. Then later on in the campaign, like I say, we took one piece up front. It was a big Japanese pillbox, and 16 inches had dented it. Nothing. They threw at it, couldn't dent it. And we got up there and started firing, trying to put rounds into the uh, slot on the pillbox. And. There was another little 37 millimeter in a tank gun on the ridge next to us. And they were firing when the Japs had run out of the holes that we had flush out. They'd fire one round of a 37 millimeter, elevating, traversing, one round in one shot. And finally, you'd see them, you'd hear them, hey, clapping their hands and so forth. I wonder what they said, look, they tell us every time we pull a landed on this 75 millimeter halibutson, that's $18.75 war bond for one round. And I said, who are you all using a round of 37 millimeter where you could be using your M1 rifles? And I don't know what that round cost, but I said, y'all ought to quit that and use your rifles instead of that thing as a sniping gun. Oh, they were, <laughs> they were a bunch. So eventually you were able to uh, kill this pillbox uh, and discard it. Right, right. Uh, plus, as the history book says, we destroyed everything in a 300-yard range out there. Uh, lost one man doing it. Now, at what type of rounds were you uh, sitting? You had HE, phosphor, uh, white phosphorus. phosphorus. Yeah, we had um, uh, shell HE charge. It was all high explosive, <clears throat> and it was what they call uh, semi-fixed. You'd take the projectile out. The brass case had a powder bag around the primer. I think it had like four silk powder bags, one, two, three, and four. And if the command would come down, charge two, that meant you took the projectile out, cut off three and four and threw it aside, and then uh, put the thing back on, ready to go into the breach. and. Uh, or if it was uh, charge one, he took th three of them out. And um, as I say, the ammunition was semi-fixed. And then you'd put it back together and slam it in the breach when you were ready to fire. So by taking out the powder bags, that would, is that the distance that the projectile will be going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in other words, if you fired <clears throat> charge four, that would be out to your maximum range. and. Uh, which I think was about four and a half, five miles. Of course, the island was only, I think, two and a half miles long. So you guys had a pretty steep uh, trajectory, I would think. Uh, yeah, fairly steep, yeah. Okay. Now, you have shown me some pictures of you and your fellow uh, Marines on the island. Like any situation, no matter how bad it is, you always seem to find time for a laugh. No matter how bad it got, you always, always laughed. Uh, I guess that was another reaction of battle, just to keep your wits to you. I mean, you know, the, as a mask, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, but it was always funny. Tell me about some of the um, pranks or jokes or the things that made you laugh with your fellow servicemen. Well. 
one of the things uh, that made me laugh is when uh, uh, I looked around to my buddy who would smoke cigars, dip snuff, and chew tobacco at the same time. And we got into heavy rain about day day plus three or four, somewhere along there. When he opened his pack, when we had a little bit of lull in firing to get out his tobacco to have a cigar, every bit of it was soaking wet, the brown water running out of his pack when he held it up. And I think he might have even cried a little bit. <laughs> But about that time, my brother, who was in the 31st CB Battalion, found out where we were, and he brought a six, one single cigar over for me. And I looked at it, I said, Luke, you need this cigar worse than I do. Here, you take it. So I gave it to him, and he nursed that thing for several days. I'm sure that he did. Yeah. That's pretty unique that your brother was able to be in the same geographical area you were in, considering exactly. the war was in two theaters. Yeah. Your brother was in the Seabees. He was in the 31st Seabee Battalion, and somewhere I have a picture <coughs> of his battalion, uh, or Seabees, making a road up Mount Suribachi, which they did in four days, and the Japs couldn't do it in 24 years that they were there. And those men were terrific. I mean, most of them were, we had a saying, uh, never kick a CB in the pants because his grandson may be a Marine. They were all 45, 50 years old construction people and they knew what they were doing. And they came in to repair Airstrip 1 so the B-29s could start landing and they were being shot up so bad over Japan. And that was one reason for taking Iwo to give those B-29s a place to land instead of ditching at sea. So tell me how you and your brother encountered one another. The first time well, was in, at the time, they were not yet attached to it, but he was on the West Coast. And I met him in uh, Cal uh, Hollywood, California, and we went together and had a meal. Then we shipped out to Hawaii, and as a, we were scheduled to go, I forget which campaign was going on at the time, but we were scheduled to go into that and they changed their mind. We went overseas as what we call a reinforced regiment, infantry regiment, artillery, and so forth. And um, that was, um, we couldn't write back home. We went to Hilo, Hawaii, but I could not write back home and tell our folks where we were, my mother and dad even though you could buy the Honolulu advertised paper anywhere in the United States in the big cities, 5th Marine Division lands in the warrior, but we couldn't write home and tell them where we were. So my brother uh, came over and he was able to tell mother and dad where we were. But the way that happened, I didn't know my brother was coming over. And I was sitting there in our tent, we had six man tents, and in the center of the tent was one pole and we had a little desk of a table about two feet square. I was writing a letter home and had borrowed a pen from my next door tent, my neighbor uh, buddy. And I was just getting ready to sign my last name and I heard my buddy Fitz call from outside. He said, Jim. I said, Fitz, I'll be out in a minute with your pen. I'm signing my name. So I signed a name and as I walked out of the tent into the darkness, somebody tackled me. We went down to the ground. We started fighting right when about two seconds ahead me pinned on my back. I looked up and it was my brother. So they were stationed, uh, the whole battalion was just within a couple of hundred yards of us. They had a big tent area. And then uh, from there, of course, they went to Iwo Jima with us. And uh, that's where he found me again on Evo. How did that make you feel, big brother is in town, so to speak? Well, I've got a letter from him somewhere back there that uh, when he came over to the gun pit, when the word came down they needed somebody to go up front with the gun to fire direct fire. And my brother <clears throat> had just come there and he said, we don't want volunteers, we're gonna draw straws. So my brother happened to be there and my sergeant said, George, my brother's name, 
He said, you hold the straws, and each one of us was going to pick. Uh, they needed two men for my uh, gun to go and pick, and there'd be two short straws somewhere. So my brother was holding his thumb out like this, and he kept doing this. He was trying to give me one of the long ones, but anyway, I reached it and just got one, pulled on it, and it came out short. And he told me then, I said, look, man, I told him, I said, just tell mother and dad, I said, I may not come back from this, but tell mother and dad that I died doing what I wanted to do. And uh, not to mourn my death, anything like that. And we went on up, of course, got back okay. He had, he had about four close calls on the island. <clears throat> So you guys were able to share a moment then of big brother trying to protect little brother. Yeah. But, you know, you both were grown men knowing what you were doing was not, uh, it was very important actually. Yeah. So that's a wonderful story. Let's talk about the camaraderie. You know, we talked about the laughters that you have with your uh, fellow servicemen, in this case, your fellow jarheads. And, you know, it's always often spoke about how Marines have a special bond oh, yeah. uh, regardless of their age difference. Uh, here you and I are both Marines, but yet 40 years separate us in age or better, but yet I feel like I've known you for 25 years. Yeah. Talk to me about the camaraderie that you have with your, your uh, Marines there on the island. Uh, I guess it's because you're so dependent on each of them, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that you form this bond. And after all, if you eat and sleep and live with somebody for two and a half or three years, you get to know them better than they probably know themselves. And I think that's what uh, makes us bond, for one thing. Plus, all of us being through the same uh, training and knowing what it takes to be a Marine. A, pride, uh, a proud um, title to wear, for sure. Yeah. You had a very interesting story that you were telling me uh, when you were out looking um, at Mount Sarabachi. Could you uh, reflect on that and tell me that story again? We had a little bit of lull in uh, firing, and our first sergeant was from uh, Georgia, a tall, slim fellow that uh, had a real southern drawl. And I happened to, I'd been watching Surabachi, they were shelling the dickens out of it, and uh, by the way, when you see a 16-inch broadside from a battleship, you can actually see the shells going through the air. I don't know if you knew that. They're huge. But anyway, I was watching the Douglas Dauntless dive bubbles were coming down, they were dropping napalm on the uh, island and so forth, flowing down the side, and I could see a flag go up. Uh, couldn't see stars and stripes, but I knew it was a flag. And I yelled to the gunnery sergeant. He had a pair of binoculars. I said, Gunny, put your glasses over there on top of Surabachi and see if that's ours. And he turned around and put the binoculars up there. And I hear him now, just like yesterday. It sure in the hell is. Well, about that time, there were like 900 ships in Omada swing, uh, get, uh, anchored around uh, Iwo. And all of them started blowing their horns, tooting their horns. And uh, it was really, uh, and you could hear actual cheer go up from the island. And of course it didn't walk the end of the fighting. It was still five or six weeks ahead of us. Again, a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, do you recall where you were at when you heard that Germany had surrendered? Uh, Germany, no, I don't, but I can tell you exactly where we were when Japan surrendered, I mean, announced it. We were, uh, had a Quonset hut in uh, Camp Tarawa at one island of Hawaii. And we were in there, they'd serve coffee and donuts in there. And they had one radio. And it was right by division headquarters, a big flagpole out there. Anyway, we were all gathered around the radio, and the first one that came through was false alarm, sort of. And they said there would be another announcement later, and we all sat around there waiting. 
and they came through and said it's official that Japan has surrendered. And with that, we all went outside and here comes a division band playing the Marine Corps hymn down to the flag and when they stopped, they played the Star Spangled Banner and there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd. We were all running around slapping each other on the back. Uh, it was, and it's funny how you remember so many of the humorous things and uh, standing out. I'd like to tell you about one. We were practicing, <laughs> practicing some uh, landings on San Clemente Island off the coast of California, not, uh, I don't, not too far out. But we went ashore and landed, and we were supposed to dig a small foxhole. Well, we dug one about knee deep. And there were cactus all around. And there was the type of cactus with those little red about golf ball sized balls with all the spines on them. And time to take a break, it was about lunchtime, so we each had a care ration. And Slim was standing with his knees in the foxhole and standing up and opened his care ration. And he sat down with his feet in the foxhole and sat down on the side on the ground. And when he did, naturally, his seat spread apart and he sat right directly on one of those prickly pear cactus balls. And he jumped back up, of course when he jumped up screaming, they went, <laughs> went back together and it, he screamed even louder. Well, he ran to the first guy and Fred was laughing so much. He, <laughs> and if you can imagine Slim bending over, stooping over him, trying to hold both cheeks apart, and Slim reached up, I mean, Fred reached up to grab it with his fingers. Of course, he stuck his fingers right away. Mm -hmm. Well, then he gets his cable, his combat knife out, and starts kind of like opening an oyster shell, trying to pry the thing loose. And Slim's still screaming, and Fred got to laughing so bad. By the time he made the rounds, he was ready, I think, to, um, if he'd hit ammunition, I think he'd have shot everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, okay, uh, let's see, so we got that. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, excuse me. You've gotten news that the uh, Japanese are, uh, have said they're going to surrender. Then you guys go occupy Japan. We went on oh, no, occupy Japan, right. Tell me about and, that. Yeah, and uh, of course, I think I mentioned that we had quit training and we were getting ready to head out to invade Japan itself when they dropped the atomic bomb. And to this day, I say, I don't want to ever get in an argument about how bad it was. I say, I'm here today because of that atomic bomb and a lot of other guys too. Had we invaded Japan, it would have been a massacre, both Japanese and us too. And uh, in fact, when we occupied Japan, we went into the same area that we would have invaded. And we went into Sasebo, Japan, the first troops in, which was a harbor. And there were no beaches. The mountain came right down to the ocean. And all you had to do was look, approaching that. And there were guns sticking out all over the place, bristling with cannons embedded in that rock. And it would have been, it would have been a brutal place to land. How long were you in uh, Japan? Uh, seemed like we went in in uh, about six, went in in August, uh, about seven, eight months, seemed like. And you remember what city you were at? Uh, yeah, went in to Sasebo first, and then from Sasebo we moved up to um, Isahaya. I, uh, the Japanese air base, and um, that's where we stayed until we came back home. Did you have any interaction with any of the uh, Japanese people? Oh yes, yes. What kind of reception uh, did you get? At first, we didn't know what to expect, and we didn't know whether they would be belligerent or what. And uh, even the policeman that was standing around, um, we went out, fanned out right away on patrols. And we would come back with a huge six by a truck. Well, we'd go through villages, stop till the local chief of police 
that we'll be back through here in such a time we want all the weapons collected. And to this day, had we had to invade Japan, we would have had to kill, I hate to say it, every man, woman, and child because each one was armed. And we came back from those patrols with a truck, big six by truck, biggest truck the Marine Corps had, loaded down up to the top with weapons, knives, swords, uh, shotguns, even the old punt guns like they used up in Chesapeake Bay to kill ducks, the big blunderbuss ends on the thing. Uh, and when it, we would come back with a truckload, they had a bulldozer waiting. And we would pass them out in a line and throw them on this, some of the most beautiful shotguns you'd ever want to see. Throw them on this pile. And when we got all unloaded, they would throw diesel fuel on there and burn what would burn. Then after that got finished, they would take the bulldozer and grind it mash up everything they could and dig a big hole, bury it. And uh, I can remember one that was handed to me as I had to pass on off the truck. Beautiful double barrel shotgun, L.C. Smith, which was the prince of shotguns back then. I can still see it, it went by. On the breach back there was a silver inlay of a pheasant hunting scene. Two bird dogs and a man standing up with a shotgun and on the trash pile it went. Amazing. So how long did this go on that you were collecting weapons? Uh, uh, until we covered the whole area, probably two weeks. Maybe and, so. <clears throat> and the people, <clears throat> excuse me, and the people were not resistant to this? No, uh, they were not. Uh, they were hungry for one thing. Uh, I can remember, well, for example, none of them got belligerent or anything, no, we, we felt perfectly safe. And I remember we did uh, guard duty, went into a place that still exists today, Mikimoto Pearl Farm, and you can buy Mikimoto pearls in the jewelry stores today. We did interior guard duty on that place, and I can remember a lieutenant coming by, and he showed us a silver pearl that Mickey Moto gave him, which your silver was much more valuable, or black pearl, than the regular white pearls, to bribe him so that we would not go in and steal everything that he had in there. And the Lieutenant said, you don't have to worry about that, don't. And, uh, but we did go duty on a place as beautiful as you, never want to see a place. Um, but the Japanese, um, I remember again my good buddy Luke who chewed tobacco. Poor guys were hungry. We'd go into the chow hall and chow we had wasn't that good at all. We ate corned beef hash for seven months, I guess. That was it. And we'd come out and they had garbage cans. We'd empty our mess kits. And Luke would always come out with his mess kit and then take a big chew of tobacco. Looked like he was eating one of those uh, K-ration fruit balls or something, or C-ration fruit ball. Yeah. I can remember one day this poor Japanese standing there and he looked at Luke when he took a bite on that tobacco and through sign language and pidgin English, he wanted a bite of it. And Luke gave him a piece of it. He ate it and swallowed it. And that poor guy laid on the ground the rest of the day. He couldn't get up and do anything. <laughs> So you guys stayed there, uh, retrieved weapons. Um, the people were uh, receptive as well as they could be. Did they? <clears throat> did you ever hear any scuttlebutt or any talk about uh, they knew about the bombs that had happened in Nagasaki and Hiroshima? The other Japanese? Mm, no, except for the one I, I told you about that was only an aircraft gun. Uh, none of them ever mentioned. Um, I went through Nagasaki. I think that bomb was dropped in August or September, October. About, I got put in charge of a PX and I used to have to go down and pick up supplies from Nagasaki. And, uh, cause it was springtime with the cherry blossoms blooming, which was a beautiful drive down there. You got to Nagasaki, everything was flat. 
and I walked through ground zero, everything, and I'm sure it was still plenty radioactive. Nobody knew it. Nobody, nobody around. You could walk right through it. Well, I certainly agree with you. It's uh, a great loss of life, uh, but it also saved a lot of lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, theirs them. and ours, Yeah, for sure. Um, so after this, you uh, end up coming back to San Diego and you're discharged. Right. When it came time, we, of course, came back to San Diego and got put in a, uh, went from uh, Japan back to Hawaii, to Pearl Harbor, Honolulu. And we got put in a pool there that uh, it would take so many each day to go back to the States, whatever sh ship they had available, take you back. And I can remember going on Liberty and meeting a fellow from New Orleans, a sailor, and we sat down and ate a good meal together. And he was on an aircraft carrier. And he said, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we're taking a bunch of Marines back to the States Monday. I said, boy. I I can't wait because I was up next for the next load or, or getting close to it. They do it alphabetically. I said, after traveling all over these rusty LSTs, troop transports, that's going to be a wonderful trip on the aircraft carrier. We fell out that day. The list stopped, about 20 in front of me, and they all got on the aircraft carrier and left. So the next day, they called out the names again, and I told my buddy, I said, man, <laughs> we had our gear and we were going down to the dock. I said, if there's a LST down there, I'm going to walk back home. Well, we rode around and pulled up and I felt the boat bump and looked up. There was a LST. The whole starboard side had been stove in on the big Okinawa typhoon that had sunk, I think, a cruiser and a destroyer. And that's what we came back to the States on. Uh, the steam kettles wouldn't work. So all we had three times a day is what they could fry. And that got old pretty quick. But uh, we got back home, pulled into Port Wyneme, California. There was no band waiting for us or nothing. And guess who I saw the first person on the dock that caught the rope? A Japanese American, I said. Anyway, that's where we came back, came back home. So how was your reception when you got back home home? I mean, uh, and how was your, um, again, a transformation now from a military life of fighting for your life and for your country yeah. to now peacetime? Talk to us about that. Well, first of all, that's why nobody could understand, um, could stand Ellen Roosevelt. What she wanted to do, of course, during the war, they had war dogs. That Dobermans, uh, that they would train to be sentry dogs and uh, we had a bunch of them she wanted to take all the marines this was Eleanor Roosevelt and detrain them like they would detrain the war dogs quote to make them fit to go back into society so you might ask some of the marines what they thought of Eleanor Roosevelt but anyway um, we uh, got put into this pool and uh, came on back home and uh, I rode train from Biloxi, I mean from uh, the West Coast on back to Biloxi to New Orleans. My sister lived in New Orleans at the time and she, she met me on the train, her and her husband. And it was a wonderful, wonderful reunion. How long before you saw your brother that was overseas as well? Uh, how long before I saw him? Yes, sir. Probably a couple of years. So, did <clears throat> um, was he still with the CBs for a while? Or uh, yeah, what happened before they went to the West Coast? Uh, he went in real early in the war, and they were sent to Bermuda. They spent, I think, been a year, year and a half on Bermuda, then came back to the states, and that's when they were sent out to the West Coast and then assigned to the 5th Marine Division. That would have been 43, 44. So when the war was over, how long before you saw him again? Uh, the last time I saw him was on Iwo Jima, and after that, I don't know if you find him. 
probably another six months, eight months, something like that. Very good. So needless to say, your mother and father were happy to see their oh, yeah. son come home. Right, right. Yeah, in fact, my mother, <clears throat> when uh, she found out that my brother was with me on Iwo Jima, she had a nervous breakdown, and she had quite a time of it. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, let me see. We get here. You made adjustments. Now, as you come back home, what kind of career did you pick up uh, when you got back? I had when I left. <clears throat> excuse me, when I finished high school in 43, my uncle owned a drugstore in Biloxi. And I thought, well, that'll be a nice thing to get into, uh, become a pharmacist. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going to delay it now because I want to get in service. Well, the GI Bill came along, and to me that was the greatest thing that this country's ever done. And it was within, I remember reading, with all the money that the government put into the GI Bill, that just in the increased earnings from income tax, the program had paid for itself just within a few years. And that's how I went to school on the GI Bill. You had uh, so many months, uh, you, you had a formula, I think. Uh, I spent, right after I got home and got discharged, I took a job for about seven months building boats, working for a company that built car top boats in. Back then there were no boat trailers. When you had these beautiful little 14 foot plywood skiffs you put on top of your car. So I did that for about seven months and used the GI Bill on that because he could hire us and the government would make up the difference in what he paid and what we got from the GI Bill. Well, I still had plenty of months left over to finish uh, pharmacy school and which was, uh, uh, when I finished pharmacy, I still had, I think about three or four months left. I could have gone to something else. But I went to Ole Miss and took pharmacy. How do you think, if anything at all, your wartime experiences helped you in your civilian life to where you're at today? Uh, learned a little bit of judo and how to fight helped a little bit in a couple of situations. <laughs> but um, um, I guess. First of all, I was in doggone good physical shape. And uh, in fact, my measurements, when you went in, when I went in the court and came out, I had lost four inches in the waist and gained two inches in the chest. So that was from running a mile every morning before breakfast and so forth and all other stuff we had to do. But uh, I was in good shape and Several times had to escort some drunks and stuff out of the drugstore and uh, narcotic addicts and so forth. So I learned some judo. My brother was real good at judo, by the way. How about life lessons? How do you think the military served you in that capacity? Uh, uh, life lessons. Life lessons? Uh, well, the motto, Semper Fidelis, is one, uh, be prepared, uh, is another, uh, uh, it's... Uh, I mean, as a Marine, I, I know that from my experience and almost every, you know, that no matter what we turn out to be in life, that just what you just said, uh, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Yeah. Uh, you and, know. And discipline and, uh, you know, things like that. Right. Um, and you went on to have seven children with your wife? Oh, uh, right. Five and, boys and uh, two girls. And you were yeah. married for how many years? Forty, no, fifty-seven now, I think. Yeah, fifty-seven. Very good. Well, sir, I want to thank you for your time, and I want to thank you for your service and your dedication to our country well, in her time you. of need. Yeah. And this will conclude the interview with uh, James E. Quint on August the 20th, 2010.